Welcome to the Winning with Shopify podcast. This is the podcast to help you scale your Shopify store into a money-making machine. Influencer marketing can deliver a high ROI and potentially turn your product into a success. But how do you start working with influencers? It's easy. Download the Afluencer app to your Shopify store. Afluencer has over 20,000 influencers looking to work with brands just like yours. And affordable micro-influencers can deliver great results results on a shoestring budget. Afluencer is offering a free exclusive influencer strategy session to Winning with Shopify listeners to discuss your product and the best influencers for your business. Book your session at afluencer.com slash WWS. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Winning with Shopify podcast. For anyone that's not tuned in before, it's an absolute pleasure to have you tuning into the show today. My name's Nick, and I've been running the show for about three and a half years, and prior to myself was a lady called Caroline. Uh, Caroline's still involved. She's still a good friend of mine. She still tunes in as well. So if you're listening, Caroline, hello. Welcome to your old podcast. And for anyone who's been tuning in for a while, it's a pleasure to have you guys back. Thank you so much for tuning in week in, week out. Um, We're probably not posting this on a Friday because we're recording this quite late, so apologies. But we do normally post every Friday. So if you want to check out the podcast, hit the subscribe button, leave us a nice review and every Friday we'll pump out a new episode. Today we are continuing our series talking about influencer marketing and talking with content creators and brands about how they use people who post a lot on social or create content. Joining me today is a very special friend of mine who I have genuinely traveled the world with um, as well in a professional capacity having a lot of fun. Um, His name is Michael Thomas and he's a content creator. You may know him as London Viewpoints. So Michael, welcome to the show. Hi Nick, thanks for having me on your podcast. Well, it's great to have you with us. And um, I've had you on a stage before and I've interviewed you, but never on a podcast. So welcome to the podcast. And to dive into today's content, why don't you kick off by giving us a little bit of background to what you were doing prior to content creation and prior to running your Instagram channel, and also a little bit about what you do today. So briefly to introduce myself, uh, then it's my name is Michael Thomas. Uh, I'm a content creator slash influencer. Uh, which I don't, I'm not quite fond of that name, but it is what it is. Um, I started my journey in uh, photography and video uh, more than 10, 12 years ago. Uh, I was shooting uh, for fun, then started doing some weddings, some events, uh, helping other friends who run production companies as a sort of a B cameraman, B photographer, then moved on to getting my own gigs. And um, all during that, I always enjoyed architecture and uh, shooting time lapses. And that's how I started um, the channel London Viewpoints. It was initially meant to be just completely for fun. Me sharing along my drives around London or wherever I traveled, uh, finding the best viewpoints in London and uh, sharing them and the locations where one can go for a nice road that offers a fantastic vista of London or a bar with a view or any attractions that offer a nice skyline view in London. And that kind of spiraled into me working with uh, lots of hotels, real estate, uh, as well as brands that have something to do um, in common that would be of interest to to my audience. Um, And that allowed me to work with a variety of uh, fantastic brands over the years. Uh, And even though, as I say, influencing is not my main part of um, what I do in terms of content creation, I do, do shoot still a lot for clients that then they use on their marketing uh, channels on their own socials. Uh, So I do content delivery for the clients. Uh, But yeah, briefly, that is what I do. Amazing. Amazing. And one thing I love as well is the way you've slowly staggered your way up into doing what you do today. It wasn't like you got out of bed one morning and saw, um, I don't know, one of the world famous, like Casey, whatever his name is, uh, YouTubers and went, I'm going to be like that. It was kind of you were interested in photography and camera work, work your way up as a, as you say, a B, you know, sort of B cameraman, and then worked up to doing getting your own gigs. It's quite an awesome story because it's much more authentic, I think, than just setting out one day saying, I just want to be an influencer and content creator. But I'm going to ask about that word because it's been a controversial topic. And obviously, we've also had um, I probably not even mentioned to you, Michael, we had Christiane on the show um a few months ago as well. Um oh, okay. so we've had Christiane on having the same conversation and, and saying a very similar thing to you about influencing. Um, why don't you like the term influencer? Because I think brands call you guys influencers so actually brands listening i think we need to sort it out but tell us why michael why why, why do you prefer content creator or, or another title i think because how the media portray a typical influencer mm. doing either crazy stuff that's i don't know illegal shameful stuff that just shouldn't be done for the sake of likes uh and just 
thinking maybe too much of themselves and mm. i don't know in the middle of the restaurants you know doing a vlog shouting over people and telling people that i'm working here like th- that sort of stuff is normally what portrays an influencer which mm. i don't want to be part of I, yeah. I kind of believe that i do offer value to um to my audience but at the same time i respect people around me and don't think of myself as the most important person even if i'm <laughs> in the crowd uh so so yeah, yeah i do do jobs mm. as an influencer but i bear in mind that yeah that is not the most important uh job in the world <laughs> yeah yeah and if i'm brutally honest i i mean again i know michael through uh, an organization called traverse that i'll shout out we've had paul on um on the podcast briefly before as well um he's from traverse and a, a lot of the guys we meet it's it's almost um you almost want to make the content as authentic as possible and so i think not shouting at people or saying right everybody get off this bridge so i can get a picture of it it's like show the bridge full of people you know show the real environment people are actually going to go and enjoy because otherwise, I think in in this world of social media and authenticity, it's only a matter of time until someone says, I came to see this beautiful hotel and the pictures were amazing and I got there and it was absolutely rammed. You know, like the bar was just full like a pub and that's not what I signed up for. It's like, we'll show it like that. And then people that like that environment, they're the ones that will come along and it'll be the right environment for them. So you'll actually have a better, better output. But I certainly, going back to what I was saying about being um, completely honest... I used to think that a lot of influencers or content creators would say I'm more of a content creator than influencer because they just couldn't really build their own following and, and develop it, if I'm brutally honest. But actually meeting you guys and spending time with yourself, Michael, and um, I mean, driving around Trentino with a, a drone following us that you were piloting and I was driving the car was quite exciting. And I think going on things like that and then suddenly seeing that actually it's a real creative process. And actually, if you did try and influence with the content you created and focus more on the influencing influencing side of things, your content can't be relevant to everybody. And bear in mind, you're working with like a hotel back then, then tourism boards. And then, as you say, lots of hotels and other places, it's you can't cater for all those different audiences and keep it entertaining, which is why I think actually your Instagram works where, um, you know, where you post more sort of behind the scenes content. But why don't you tell us a bit more about that then? So what, what do you actually post on your Instagram versus what you would maybe do more commercially for a business or, or a brand that was hiring you? Um, for brands, most of the work that I actually do is uh, interiors, exteriors and time lapses of a beautiful sunrise happening over the the asset that the client has, usually being buildings or or interiors uh, or certain products from time to time. Uh, Well, personally, I show the places that I sometimes get to go and share unique locations. Like sometimes when I'm working with a a client that, for example, owns a skyscraper and they sell it or rent it out, uh, I get access, for example, to the roof of that skyscraper uh, to show to shoot some um, content for the client while well, that can go on my Instagram on the story, or I can show a time-lapse that I shot from that building as it's just something unique. And I will mention that unfortunately not everyone's allowed to go there. It's not a public spot, but I wanted to share it with you guys because it's something that not many get to see. And from mm-hmm. my channel, I'm just sharing it with you so that you, you get a glimpse of what it looks like there from the top. Cause it's a cool view. Uh, so I try mm-hmm. to differentiate the stuff that, I shoot for clients, but then sometimes the clients want me to do sponsored posts as a sort of a, a collaboration or partnership with them. And I do promote the client's product um, being stay in the hotel, the building that the building for, for sale or, or, or could be sometimes even uh, a toy that I've been recently working on. Toy that's still related uh, within the travel market, weirdly. But yeah, I can't share too much on that. But <laughs> soon that will be <laughs> revealed. So so yeah, I do a lot of work that sort of aligns with the things that I enjoy doing um, specifically because the last thing I would want to do is something that I'm not quite enjoying. So I still yep. try to focus on the core elements of I enjoy this. I like this. My audience will still enjoy this. And I do for clients all sorts of other stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, one, one thing I think is a really important point, actually, for anyone listening, and this is kind of goes well outside of what we're talking today about. But you, you just reminded me, Michael, that something I say a lot to my staff, actually, in, in, in our agency is sometimes we can do the most amazing project and we get really precious and proud about this project. And you show the client and they basically say it's rubbish. And it can be absolutely heartbreaking to receive that feedback when you put your heart and soul in. 
what has actually happened and what I say to my staff a lot is it was never ours in the first place. So we shouldn't be precious about it. Actually, we should be precious about the result or the impact it has. So even the client's comment, whether they love it or hate it, is also kind of irrelevant. There's obviously a level of relevance. We want to do work that our clients want and feel that they paid for. But there's also that element, I think, of saying that actually this is the content you're shooting, for example, it's for the audience of whoever has hired you. So actually, you might shoot something and go, this is not how I would do it. So actually, and I know you do this as well sometimes, Mark, you have one camera for your Instagram doing the hyperlapse or whatever that you want to show. And then you have the, the the other camera for the client as well going, it's a great opportunity. I'm going to show some behind the scenes footage and stuff. And I personally, if, if you don't follow Michael, he is fascinating. Like a lot of influencers will constantly be on the beach drinking cocktails. Michael is not one of those influencers at all. His Instagram account is amazing. And um, you, you passed my house recently and we, um, you know, we sort of stood up there being attacked by bees, I think it was a passing yeah, through it was, yeah. um but yeah i was shooting a hyperlapse of london up on a hill near where i live um, you know watching the, the sun go down behind the buildings and um and actually he- hearing you sort of sit you know sitting there and telling me about all the cameras and what was going on i think it's really authentic but it's it's, it's holding on to that whatever you as a business are working with a content creator for the more you can and we talk about briefing i think now is, is, is a good segue into this the more you can brief these guys as to what you're trying to get out of it the more they can produce and the less you'll just get a michael thomas ready for london viewpoints instagram account um piece of content and more something that actually i understand who you're working with who you're trying to target here who engages with this where it's going to show all that kind of stuff so without giving too much away michael why don't you tell us about actually briefing and how important that how you like to do that process how important that process is for a brand to talk to a content creator before they start I think a brief, uh, as detailed as it can be, is very important at the start of uh, any partnership, any campaign uh, with a brand. Uh, That could start for me easily by just an exchange of few emails. uh, And if a client, for example, has a specific message they want to deliver or specific uh, list of items they want to showcase, please list them out, make me a, a PDF. And then once I review that, then ideally I would always jump uh, on some sort of a call, a team's call if the client's busy or even have a meeting in person. I, I believe that a meeting in person just gets you a better relationship with the client. The client sees you in person. We we engage either over a coffee or in the client's offices or anywhere, really. I think uh, person-to-person communication is best. That can drive uh, us getting into a, a better idea of what the campaign might be. We will jump off each other's ideas and then form something that the client will be happy as well as I will be really excited to produce. But then we can also sort of split it into two directions. Who is the actual campaign uh, directed for? Is it for my audience? Is it gonna be going as a sort of an influencing campaign that I will be posting it on my socials? Or is it specifically for content that will be for the client? Then. If it's for my uh, my audience, I will tell the client what angle I see that the audience will engage with it best because uh, I know sort of the interests of my audience, what works, what doesn't work, uh, how I would do it to make it better for my audience. But if the client tells me that it's more for their content, their socials, mm-hmm. their, their marketing, then I would like to find out more what previous campaigns, how they worked, what didn't work, what audience reacts to best and what vision do they have it so that they are happy and obviously the audience that they will be delivering to will also react well to it. So, so yeah, I, I believe bouncing off a few emails first, then some sort of a brief that both parties see it uh, is in second stage and then discussing everything else in a meeting is, is the yeah, where we can definitely decide how to proceed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to pick out a few things you said. I completely agree with all of this. And I I think, again, it stems actually a bit further than just working with content creators. I think what you've just described is, I don't know if you remember my talk in Trentino at at the conference we were at. Um, They had to move me into a new room because I just put the title on saying um, how to make more money. And I had uh, about 20 seats and about 250. You were handing out Haribo for me as well, which we ran out of. So <laughs> I'd lured them in with how to make money and there's free sweets. Haribo, so like everybody, yeah. everyone at the conference wanted to come. Um, but I was talking about how to work with a brand and, and actually saying that from my perspective, an agency owner, this is how I would get hold of a brand initially, sell them a concept, get working with them. And I think whatever business relationship you're in, whether it's with a content creator, an agency, or even an ad platform is one of the notes I've written down here. So 
what you've just described, Michael, is the opposite, I would say, of how you would work with meta ads or Google ads or something where it's com- pretty much completely faceless. And it's like you log in, you buy something and it happens. Now, Affluencer, who is sponsoring this month, they have a platform where you guys can meet um, meet influencers, meet content creators. And as Brett, um, the founder of Affluencer, told us, it's more about meeting content creators these days than it is influencing, very similar to what Michael was saying. And whilst that platform is amazing... Brett puts such an emphasis, just as you have as well, Michael, on having that relationship with people, having a conversation. And actually, one of the things I found really interesting as an agency owner is when I'm pitching to work with someone, there are a few th- there are a few questions I've learned over the years. So any agencies listening, block your ears. This is my secret source to pitching. But one of the things I always like to ask is, what hasn't worked before? It's exactly what you just said, Michael, that question. What hasn't worked? And I often give it a disclaimer saying, look, I don't want you guys to feel like you're going to give me a really negative message, hire me, and I'm going to walk into what I think is an absolute battlefield trying to get a result for you. But actually, if I can understand what things haven't worked before, I can make my team and myself and, and the way we approach this different to that and we can try something new or we can have a quick conversation about those things and try and understand why that didn't work so like you just said michael about you know we posting it on on your instagram channel we putting it on the website or is it just content we're going to chuck in a dropbox and use across loads of different things um as long as you know that and it's clear up front there's not going to be any do you know what we worked with michael he was a really nice guy the content was amazing but he didn't even put it on his instagram it's like what you didn't ask so i think it's good to cover all those bases you know and say well if it's going on my instagram and you want me to be more a bit more of an influence you know an influence and decisions here as well as produce content well actually we need to shoot it slightly differently and we need to work out a way of kind of and i imagine you know it'd be good to get your thoughts on this as well michael do you have to work out that balance of going it has to fit in with my audience because i'm really i've spent years building this i'm quite pressed about that so we've got to find a way we can get your tone of voice and my tone of voice to work together when it's on my platform and also when it's on your platform with me tagged but if i'm just doing content we kind of do whatever is that is that the way it tends to work do you find indeed it's exactly how it works because some companies that I've worked with some brands uh, want their video to be more corporate, uh, more mm, impersonal, for example, without someone sometimes even speaking to the camera, just being a video overview of their hotel, for example, while Mm. my channel, I would give it a more, for example, vlog way of visiting that hotel because a corporate video would just completely not work with my audience. It would just be out of place uh so yeah i, I completely agree with mm. your statement yeah yeah absolutely absolutely good and how much do you guys and this this might get really nerdy for a second everybody in terms of um business business as usual type stuff but i think a really important point is how, how much do you tend to work with contracts and actually have something in writing saying you're paying me this i'm delivering this here's how it's going to work when it's going to happen you're going to provide access to this rooftop or whatever i'm not going to turn up with 50 of my mates including nick with cocktails yeah. to have a cocktail on the rooftop how, how much do you work with contracts to actually iron those things out you know what does that look like for you guys at least 50% of my work is over contracts, but I, I've i learned that sometimes everything that you write in an email and we agree and there's some sort of confirmation on both sides, I tend to go with that. If it's coming from a professional uh, company email, then I, I, I've read about it before, spoke to some of my friends and they all told me like, it's binding. Like if they don't pay you, you've got an email chain it's binding. It's almost like a contract. So as long as you've got some sort of proof that w- whatever's happening over the course of an email, then apparently it's binding. And I've not had any bad um, experiences with a co- client not paying me after the job got done if we just spoke over email. So thankfully, I don't know, have other creators had that problem? Uh, I- I'm not one of them. So over email, it was fine with me. Some companies, some brands work with contracts and it's more detailed, more professional. I do agree. It's probably a better way to better way of working forward, but I I don't necessarily say no to, to clients that don't provide me a contract. Yeah, good, good, good. And I think, um, I mean, email and certainly in the UK, my understanding, I've using this phrase, my understanding is, because then I'm not giving anyone legal advice. Of my course. understanding is that email is legally binding. You know, I've ended up in a small, what we call in the UK small claims court, where if somebody owes us money and they've not paid and they might say, well, we never signed a contract, we never agreed to a notice period. I can show, well, I, I emailed you the contract. You came back and said, yeah, get started. So hmm. why were you not working to those terms? And that has stood up in court, um, which is good. Anyway, you're the perfect example of what I was just saying. So yeah, it yeah. does work. 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I think the the key thing though, as we're both saying here, everyone, is make sure you agree what 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 the content creator is going to do, where they're going to post it, when things are going to be done by, and then you can avoid lots of late nights and crying and you know, over like, oh, they said we're gonna do that and they didn't do that. And I think trying to avoid those things up front is really, really key. Um Let's talk about a much more exciting topic then. I want to get that question in anyway, because I know brands have asked us like, oh, they they said they don't have a contract. Like, what should we do? And I'm sort of there. But let's talk about something much more exciting than that, Michael. Um, in terms of content then, what do you find tends to work best for an e-commerce brand? So selling stuff on their website, what kind of stuff could they come to somebody like yourself um, or another content creator and say, look, I want some content created. I sell products. What are my options? You know, where's a good place for them to start? It's a tough question, actually, uh, hmm. because for me specifically, I would first ask what the product is. Hmm. And probably within my area of expertise, I would only able to advise within the products, within the niche and sort of the travel area, travel market and a bit of real estate hotel, which is also all falls into travel that I am somewhat familiar with. Um, if someone asked me about e-commerce for a product that i've got absolutely no clue about <laughs> i would probably just advise them i can shoot whatever you want me to shoot with that product mm. uh you give me the guidance and that will not be going on my account that will just be going on your account so yeah i, I will be quite honest um mm. i think there's there's no point of you know telling bs to clients that you don't know about um yeah it's best to be honest because things will be found out easily if you know what you're talking about or not. Uh, and if you don't know the product, don't know the niche, uh, I would not advise. So uh, <laughs> I've not had many clients that worked for, that I had to shoot content specifically for e-commerce. Uh, so, so yeah, I would definitely try to first find out as much as I can, what is the product and only advice within my area of expertise, I believe. Yeah. Well, I guess it's a really important point though, isn't it? Is get the right influencer in the first place. I think, yeah, of course, uh, you yeah. know, the right content, content. I keep trying to say content creator. I keep getting it wrong on it's every right episode. Content creator, yeah. Yeah. We called this series and it's a fluencer are sponsoring it as well. So it's like, it's influencers off the end of the tongue, but I think it's a really important point actually to choose the right kind of content creator or influencer. I guess on that thread then, what is a good way for people to work that out even prior to emailing you or, or, or dropping you a line to, to ask about it? What's a good way they can see what kind of space you're in? Well, I would definitely advise doing a lot of research. Uh, if I was to be an agency and put an agency hat and say that I'm looking to work with uh, some influencers, well, I would probably be very hesitant to work with the influencers that like started their account, I don't know, less than a year ago, blew up to amazing huge numbers because uh, I've heard stories from uh, companies that I've worked with in the past where they have got into contract with some influencers, flew them across the world to create some content. Uh, they got back and they just disappeared off the face of the earth or had, a, I don't know, personal break from socials or whatever never delivered any content and they were looking for replacement because they had to satisfy another client so so picking someone that's reliable that you've spoken to um your peers maybe other um, influencers can they recommend that person probably would be good um seeing that that person obviously maybe worked in this industry and with other client with other clients for the past few years sort of gives you um yeah the confidence that that person will deliver because he's been doing it for some time obviously that person's rates then might be slightly higher so this is the risk that the client is taking pick up with someone new that may or may not deliver uh or, or go with someone established so th there's various elements to it um but industry research speaking to peers speaking to other influencers that may know that person um attending industry events where influencers um, gather um, talk to each other uh, exchange um information probably kind of like wtm or some of the conferences that we together attended uh, i see it's quite beneficial from an influencer perspective, as well as for a brand that's attending these events, because they can sort of get a feel of who they could be working with by just having these informal chats, even over drinks, um, rather than just just sending emails back and forth. Um, 
yeah, that that's the sort of advice I would give to to a brand when looking for an influencer. Yeah, I, I love it because you've got such a unique perspective. A lot of the a lot of the guys we've spoken to, they they use Affluencer as a platform, or they start digging around YouTube, or they, they as an SEO agency, we can run reports on who links to your clients' website or your competitors' websites. Sorry, so we could look at okay, they've worked with these guys before, they've been featured on, um, you know, one of our clients is in the um, kind of baby industry, and the only way is Essex. There's been loads of podcasts from stars, of the only way is Essex linking back to our client, and we told our clients said, guys, you've got all of this. They're like, yeah, yeah we paid for all of that, we know, which then led to another question of going, well, we've missed an opportunity with this we could have done so much more with it um if anyone heard that acronym wtm that's world travel market oh, and yes. i can safely say it's uh, the one in london is absolutely incredible there's a few they, they moves around the world but you literally be texting people saying where are you and say i'm in Sri Lanka. where are you oh i've just left india i'm currently in ireland and it's like oh cool i'll come to ireland and it's literally because all the tourism boards have their own things there um but it, again i think events are an amazing place to meet people because if you met a content creator and influencer at an event you like you were saying earlier, Michael, about the face-to-face -face meeting. Well, that that kicked off face-to-face. -face. You can get a real vibe for that person. Say, do you know, they are so different to our brand, our tone of voice, what we're looking for. And because you also you see them off camera, of and course. that's another really key thing. I think is, I mean, you, you're very similar, Michael, and here as you are, if it's just you and me on the way to the airport in the car versus what you do on on Instagram as well. You're very, very, very transparent, which is always quite reassuring. I find. I think if somebody is so lovely and friendly and smiley on Instagram and then you meet them and they like they swear a lot and they're always moaning about everything. And it's like, this isn't good for us. You know, this isn't a good relationship for our brand. So although it all might seem quite rosy on the front of it, I think, as I say, that face to face is not always op an option. I think Zoom's also a good, um, good opportunity to, you know, it's an interview and you're interviewing each other. Am I happy to work for this brand? And does and and, and is this brand think, sitting there thinking, is this influencer or content creator good for me as well? Um. So I guess I guess one one thing as well I will ask while we're talking about finding the right influencer or the right content creator, um, how would you recommend people would find someone like you apart from obviously influencer have the platform and you kind of filter people start sending messages out in the absence of a platform like that or let's say you found someone on a platform what what how do they start doing that research bit how do you how do you look into what are the things you're looking for i love the thing you said about the experience you know is their account older than a year and i think now it should be maybe three five years looking at that they, so you know that they, they're not going to do a really great campaign for you and then suddenly do something for your competitor the day after or um or somebody you know quite horrific compared to your brand what's a good way people could find you organically without a platform and also what does that research phase look like uh you're asking from a client perspective yeah yeah basically. if they wanted to find you basically to, to come work with somebody like yourself i think most likely most of my work actually how people find me is through some sort of recommendation or or, or seeing my work somewhere online uh, i don't really spend much on advertising my work because somehow it seems like enough work which it's a very privileged position uh, to be at seems to be somehow coming my way and one client tends to recommend me to another and that's that's how most of my work comes about and i do seem to retain quite a lot of clients for um repeat business which is which is always great I mean, means i must be doing something right um so if i was to recommend the client to somehow find the right influencer um i would definitely do research from anything to on um on google as well as on every social media um see who someone that you already like and found uh that 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 aligns with with the concept of what you're trying to create who are they following and maybe do a little bit of research on clicking who are they following mm -hmm. uh or or if you worked with already someone that within that niche literally just ask a previous uh, collaborator previous partner we want to try some other content but maybe you could actually recommend us someone who who you would trust and that sort of puts uh, a big emphasis on 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 the trust with the previous creator that they have to find someone that maybe they will get some more work with that mm -hmm. client in the future but in the meantime who can they um promote within his or her peers uh, of 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 other creators um i would always trust on the word of mouth and just actually someone that recommends you and then you can have the first chat first email conversation with that person and first sort of zoom meeting or anything um otherwise people search through hashtags locations uh like if they they found me because i posted something naturally about 
some place that I've been and I enjoyed and they saw that photo and they reached out to me and they wanted to work with me. So so sometimes me putting out images and videos and reels mm -hmm. about places that I just, just enjoy um, got me the work to work with that client later on organically because the, that owner of that asset saw that. Um, so yeah, I, I do that a lot and that's how I sort of like try to attract sometimes new clients and I do a lot of my own pitching myself. So I... As an influencer, actually reach out to the clients uh, and and ask like, I would love to work with you because I've done this in the past. And I think we would be a perfect fit. Uh, so yeah, I also just try to be proactively uh, finding my own work in the sort of um, quieter periods. Yeah, yeah, doing exactly what I told you guys to do in my talk what five years ago. Yeah, um, <laughs> but no, I think you raised some really good points then. I think one of them I, I totally emphasize. Uh, and it's very similar for us in our business. So anyone listening, looking for agencies as well as influencers and content creators, word of mouth is so important. And because you you trust people. And actually, yeah. we've um we we have a big mind map on the wall of the office. No one watching on video. Um, I won't show you, but it it's basically over in that direction of the office. The reason I won't show you is because some of it's got the odd word on that's slightly controversial. Um, like some people introduce us to clients, but they're always the wrong type, and we feel bad saying no. We still want the introductions, but then on balance, we go, actually, they, they always introduce us the wrong kind of people. So we said, you know what? You need to talk to a partner of ours. We'll recommend someone who's a better fit, actually, for all of these opportunities going forward. Um, and but I think the word of mouth thing is, is really, really key. And the other thing as well is going back to what we were saying earlier about, you know, my question about um, e working with e-commerce brands. And you sort of said, well, it's great if they're in the travel space, not so great if they're not in travel, because that's your your space, your niche, the, um, or anyone on the uh, East coast of the U S a niche, which is a word I've learned running this podcast. Um, but yeah, so yeah, looking in different pe people's different niches, I think if someone's already doing something on social that you could say, Hey, you could use our product or actually like, you know, you mountain climb a lot in, um, in Wales, we want to send you to the Himalayas, you know, as your next, next big challenge. Well, that's really relevant, isn't it? And it's a game change step up. Um, I, I used to have my own YouTube channel a long time ago and don't bother looking for it, everyone. It's it's pretty much gone now because um, I turned it all off. But um, I, I used to do challenge travel videos so, and completely off my own back. It was just fun. Put it on YouTube and loads of famous YouTubers started sharing it, friends of mine. And I got loads of views on it and loads of subscribers. But I used to do challenges and it was like, OK, can I buy a car for £350 and drive it to Romania? Is that possible? And then uh, Travel Supermarket, one of the people who got in touch with me and said, actually, we want to send you on a challenge trip to Amsterdam. Here's your itinerary. You need to pack all of these things. We're going to give you an envelope of euros uh, at the airport when you take off to go there. Beyond that, we're not telling you anything. So when I landed, they gave me an envelope at the airport. And of course, I'm filming all of this. And the whole thing un un uh, you know, sort of unfolded from there. And they kept saying to me, like, who sponsored your previous videos? And I said, no one. I was like exactly what like you were just saying. I was doing it because it was fun, which meant actually the product placement and everything and the engaging with those guys then go, right, I need to get a cab back. I'm going to use their website. I'm in another country. I don't know. I don't know what the situation is with taxis where these guys are going to help you find a cab, which is quite cool. So I think, as you say, going with someone that's already doing that, I think is really important. And those referrals as well is, um, yeah, cert certainly a really good way of doing things. Um, we don't need to name any names on this next question, Michael, but obviously... It would be lovely if every campaign or every client you and I had ever worked with all went really well. It sometimes doesn't go well. So what have you learned over the years about when it doesn't go well? What are some of the things people should be thinking about doing when engaging with a content creator? I always try to accommodate all my clients' requests and uh, ask as many questions that I may have uh, before actually creating the content, because sometimes... Um, the content cannot be recreated. Some things that I shoot just happen, for example, that one time a mm -hmm. client puts up some sort of a laser show or or a fireworks. If if we don't get it the way they want, well, the fireworks not going to happen again, for example. So so they're not going to rerun it. So so asking the, all the questions that you can and literally thinking about things that, that can go wrong. Um, I've recently had a job literally speaking about fireworks uh, where it's a brand new building, brand new skyscraper that um, is still not finished, but they had some showrooms um, that I was meant to get access to and, and shoot from there. And I arrived there plenty of time earlier, which, which I always try to accommodate for, only to find out that the lifts weren't working. And I had like a backpack of 30 kilo of equipment 
and I would have to just use the stairs to get to the 30th floor. And I was not really it's a good workout. About That's that. a good workout. <laughs> and it was like, I think two days after I did legs in the gym. So the yeah, <laughs> worst timing. <laughs> So yeah, just just allowing extra time for any possible thing that could go wrong um, is key in terms of the line of work that I do, at least. Uh, but but communication, communication uh, cannot emphasize it enough how communication is important. Advising the the influencer or the content creator uh, upfront about everything that's going to be on site, contact details, emergency contacts. Um, everything that could possibly go wrong to to avoid that um to to minimize the cost of uh, who you're hiring because this can involve either added hours to editing reshoot cost um being efficient for the client is also what I, what I try to do so if if the client doesn't put enough emphasis on it i will and and some clients sometimes i've i've had feedback like oh you've asked for too much questions but I did try to explain them. If I didn't ask them, then you would be running extra cost because I would need to reshoot it. So do appreciate the fact that I'm actually taking over and now I'm asking the extra questions. So um, yeah, I would say, yeah, communication, asking questions can always improve whatever content you're creating uh, and avoid any pitfalls. Absolutely. And the other thing, which I mean, you can't really say this. I don't. Well, you I mean you could, but I don't think you would say this sitting where you are in in your position. But something Brett mentioned on the first episode we did in November, he said, "Look, when you're working with an influencer or content creator, if it goes wrong, the best thing to do is still pay them and just move on." And one of the real challenges you got to remember is like, Michael, you work for yourself, whereas it's not a business. You know, if I lost one client, it's like, okay, we've lost one, we've got loads of other ones. It's a shame and we didn't want it to go that way and we'll do everything like you say, but it's going to go wrong at times. Sometimes you've got to remember that you're a business that has working capital, it has profit and um, you know, and it, and it has money to invest in these things. And if it goes wrong and we learn something, that's worth an investment. And actually, going back to what you were saying ages ago as well about being referred or referring each other within, within the space, it is a community. And that's one thing I've really learned going on trips with you guys and, and spending time with you is it's such a close-knit community. I, I won't say who, but I remember when we were in a minibus late one night coming back from a restaurant opening or something on one of the trips. And someone said, oh my gosh, I had the worst campaign with these guys. And three other people then piped up and said, I've had a terrible experience with them. And it's like, oh yeah, I introduced you to them. I forgot to ask how it went. Well, it was a disaster, an absolute disaster. It was such a waste of time. It cost me loads of money and they refused to pay. And it's like, okay, that was in a minibus with probably, what, 10, 12 people? But those 10, 12 people then tell other people. And someone says, oh, I've got a campaign for so-and-so. And it's like, quit, quit right now. And you never, ever want to mess, because you're never going to repair. It's going to be very difficult to repair damage like that. So at least if someone says, look, they still paid me. It didn't work out. I never posted it, and I never finished the project. But they still paid me at least for what I did, or they paid me in full as an apology and took responsibility from it, learned from it, and then moved on to the next thing. So I think it's really important, actually, when it does go wrong. But I, I completely agree with everything you just said, Michael. I think emergency contacts are really good. I think it's also important to go, you know, who's going to be on the ground when I arrive? I think it's a really good question. And obviously, if they had some sort of henchman to carry your bags up those stairs, course, how many yeah. flights of stairs was it out of interest? Or did you lose 30. count? It was 30, 30 flights, right? 30 kilograms, yeah, 30 flights. One of, of the stairs. security uh, gentlemen helped me with some of my tripods. So I was only carrying my backpack. So so he was very kind to to, to offer that help. And then thankfully, like with half an hour later, the, the, the lift was restored and uh, I was able to go down. So yeah. That would have been the easy bit though, coming back down the stairs. I know, right? <laughs> so one yeah, thing yeah. that I can add to um, this last point mm -hmm. that I believe is kind of a nice mindset to, 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 to have when being either a client or or even as a content creator i've learned this just just by yeah hearing other people talk and probably some podcast or whatever thinking that any job that you do is your first job with that client or first job with that influencer and it will only lead to bigger jobs bigger campaigns bigger projects then you're not doing the job as like yeah got it done yeah fine and, and expecting that this is it. Like, I try to always pitch slightly bigger than what my clients' budgets are to, to obviously do a, do a cooler job, basically, to allow me the freedom, the creativity that I would like to do on that job. And if the client still decides to spend less budget and just minimize the amount of deliverables that I will do for the client, 
I will say, that's fantastic. I will only do this, this, and that for you. You're happy with it. I'm happy to do just that element. But I hope that with the, the, the results of this campaign, results of the content, you will like it so much that we will next time do this bigger thing because I think it will be fantastic. So if a client thinks the same way, like, let's give it a try with this new influencer. Let's give that person just a small assignment. Let's see how it goes. But with the idea in mind that we are, if it goes well, we are doing a next thing with them. Yeah, yeah. No, I love that. And almost every person I've spoken to that's in the content creation or influencer world, all of them want repeat business. It's like, you know, certain sports stars, for example, they're sponsored by certain sports brands and they're sponsored pretty much for their whole career by them. You know, like Nike will say, we make the kit for the Arsenal football team. So actually we're going to sponsor all the players individually if they want it as well. Um, But that means they get unlimited Nike stuff. They can, or Nike, um, as some call it. So you can have absolutely anything you want from the range or here's a budget of a thousand pounds a year. You can spend on stuff, just wear it. You don't even need to tag us. They just need to see the tick. That's it. And everybody yeah, knows absolutely. that Nike is one of the top brands. And so I think doing repeat business with people, whether it's the influencer side or the content creation side, the, the other thing you get with that, and I mean, 100% of my business as well as an agency is repeat. Like we we only work on long-term contracts. Mm-hmm. And long-term, if anyone's sitting there going like, oh, I was going to call you, Nick. And we have a notice period. So it's indefinite. You just let us know when you want us to start. We start the notice period and then we stop at the end of that. So actually we have to prove we're doing a good job constantly. But the thing we get, which I'm sure you get as well, Michael, is we get to evolve with the client. So when we get back from a project or every month we deliver something to the client, we're buzzing with ideas all the time to say, okay, we did this piece of content. It's ranking really well on SEO. And actually we want to do the next piece. Um, and off the next one, actually, we want to get some video content. We want to get some, um, you know, some sort of guide made or actually you're a medical business. You know, who, who comes up with the medical stuff? Oh, we have 20 doctors on the panel. Can we interview one of them? Or can you interview one of them and have a bit of content about it? And we'll put that up because that's really interesting. And actually anyone thinking of buying a product that's unsure to hear that there's 20 doctors and actually to see some of the doctors saying, yeah, we were a bit unsure. And then we started testing the product. We gave it to a few patients. Yeah, it's working really well now. That reassurance is there and it's all done through content. So I imagine that evolution must be really key for, for some of the clients you've worked with for a long time. Yes, yes. Um, um, I've done some projects with clients that started were really at small amounts, just like a basic, just one day or sometimes half a day project. And then it led to to multiple shoot days and big campaigns, which which I'm really proud of. Um, and then I was able to not just be in the capacity of like, this is what you meant to shoot, please deliver us this content. I was also like uh, engaged in almost like a consultancy way where I would tell them, what would work, what wouldn't work, how I would tweak it because they had that trust in me by then. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think to, to translate it as well from some of the stuff that, that Michael does, everyone, to, to other stuff you could do with your products if your products aren't in the travel space. So where Michael, where you shoot like a hyperlapse of um, sunrise or sunset, a beautiful hotel in front of the beach and saying, you know, especially with like a call to action, it's like we actually do sun, sunset and sunrise guided walks up and down the beach in the local area, in the local town, with, with you showing a hyperlapse of that and interviewing people. And um, it's a really powerful piece of content. The other things I've seen some of our clients do is we work with a phone case company at one point. And what they would, every time a new phone comes out, Samsung, Google, iPhone, whatever, um, they would literally drop it or they'd burn it or they'd set fire to it with the case on it and then show phone still works. And it's actually scratch proof and would do stuff like that with it, which is quite cool, Um, which all developed from one of the biggest SEO projects I've ever seen, which was called Will It Blend? which is a video series on YouTube. Ah, uh, yes. This doctor so, guy blending yeah. things. Yeah, 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 Hey, I love my new iPhone. Drops <laughs> it in the blender, turns it on. He puts a whole broom in at one point. And th- this has been going on 20 years nearly. They've been running that channel for, and it's still one of the most watched channels on YouTube. Um, oh, so they do stuff like this, but you don't, you don't just have to destroy your products as well. You can um, do lots of other stuff. Um, for example, you could um, say you've got a skincare product. You could get some influencers actually to wear that skincare for 30 days solid. Um, you know, my, my wife's been using a, a certain product. She's had really bad skin on her face um, in certain ways, and she won't mind me saying that. And she found this product in a dermatologist. You fill out a form in a dermatologist who's, uh, I don't know if you have the same word in the US, but um, it says, somebody is skincare expert skincare doctor um and they would then advise on a specific mixture of different chemicals and other stuff medicine for her face and she puts on every day and then as and then she uploads pictures every month and they then change it very slightly to say okay it's starting to do this let's change it to this and her skin's all cleared up and it's an amazing product but she i'm pretty sure she saw uh, several different influencers using that you know makeup artists and stuff using it on instagram which then influenced her decision and probably not you know you're not talking the sort of the 10 million followers and the cristiano ronaldo's of this world 
again, like we spoke about with Brett, it was kind of going from like what he calls nano influences to micro to macro and eventually up to your Kim Kardashians. Um, but actually, you know, Kim is going to do Kim stuff and Cristiano Ronaldo is going to do Cristiano stuff. It's it could be really difficult actually to get him to do something that's perfectly on brand. It's more like we're Ferrari, here's a Ferrari, go and drive it, please. Um, and that's it. Or just enjoy it and post it on Instagram every now and then. You know, that's the that's the way you work with the top guys. You're not going to get much content from them. You probably will never be able to use it yourself. But then Cristiano is the most followed person on Instagram last time I checked. So there's loads you can do on a big level. But I think I think it's all about getting that content um, absolutely right. And, and I guess, Michael, it, like you said at the start, it comes back to brief, doesn't it? It, it does. And just researching who to work with, what, how it will align with that person. And does the person know the niche? And will it deliver, would the person deliver the content with that knowledge in mind to, to perfectly fit the, the campaign, the concept, the niche? Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Well, look, we'll bring things into land there, Michael. I think, as always, I've written a whole page of notes. Um, and we'll be posting this out with the uh, links at the bottom as well to Michael's channel. So if you want to go and check them out. Um, this is our last episode with Afluencer as well. So make sure you check out those guys. There is a, I'm pretty sure there's an offer. If it's not an offer, it's just an awesome link to their website. But I'm pretty sure there is an offer. Um, apologies, I haven't got it to hand, but check in the description below. If not, um, check out Afluencer's website, which is spelled the same way as Affluencer, but they couldn't trademark that term. Um, but Michael, thank you so much for joining us. It's been great to have you on. Thanks a lot, Nick, for having me. And from what I know, I'll be seeing you quite soon again. Yes, and it's public knowledge yes. now. Yeah, I, I shall see you in Georgia, in the Middle yes, East. We'll We're see uh, each other in Georgia. Yeah, I might see you on the flight there. Actually, knowing us, we'll uh, probably carpool share or something like we did last time. Probably but, uh, we can. Yes. <laughs> there we go. Well, as I say, thank you again, Michael, and thanks everybody for tuning in. We're going to be back again next week. We've got a new series kicking off next week. I've already recorded the first couple of episodes. It's going to be super exciting. So make sure you check it out. We're going into a whole realm of conversion rate optimization, which can be super exciting. So make sure check that out thanks again for listening and we hope you enjoyed the show hit the subscribe button leave us a review and that's it we'll see you again next week 